Sam Harris 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 Sam Harris Sam Harris Harris Sam Harris Sam Harris Sam Harris Sam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone welcome back to another episode of the Islamic Defense Podcast uh, today we will discuss rationality rules again I know I've made videos on him before but uh, he made some really stupid videos so I had to respond to them so yeah let's get started peace is defined as a lack of conflict and a freedom from fear of violence it's tranquility and harmony and it's a critical component to happiness and Islam my friends is precisely not that Islam is not a religion of peace, and in this video, I want to predominantly explain why. However, for the purpose of clarity, I want to first put this argument in its syllogistic form. Peace is defined as a lack of conflict and a freedom from fear of violence. Islam acts according to, and in seek of, peace. Therefore, Islam is a religion of peace. In my opinion, when somebody employs this argument, the first thing to do is to identify how exactly they're defining the word peace. The reason being is because there are two versions of this argument. The first is one in which the proponent is sincerely asserting that Islam is a religion of peace as defined colloquially. And the second is one in which the proponent is periodically using an Islamic definition of the word peace. Hence, this is why it's important to get them to define peace from the outset. To debunk the second version first, because you know, screw logic. It's important that we first understand what exactly Islam means within the Islamic world. The word Islam is derived from the Arabic word Salam, a word literally meaning peace. And Islam as a religious practice refers to a person submitting herself or himself to the will of Allah in order to seek eternal peace and tranquility. Or to put it more bluntly, in the Islamic world, Islam is the definition of peace, and therefore Islam is, by definition, a religion of peace. Now if that's not an obvious example of circular reasoning, I don't know what is. Defining Islam as peace, and then asserting that Islam is peaceful, is as circular as defining Nazism as love, and then asserting that Nazism is loving. Not only is this confusing, it's deceitful. Uh, he's actually wrong here. The word Islam in Arabic does not mean peace. Uh, it actually means submission. Uh, it means humbling oneself and obeying commands and, and heeding prohibitions without objections and sincerely worshipping Allah SWT alone. Now, believing and also believing what he tells us and having faith in him. Now, no one in the entire world, as far as I know, understand the word Islam to mean peace. Uh, it means submission to the will of Allah SWT alone. So his first argument is based on a false premise. Therefore, his argument is unsound. What about those who assert that Islam is a religion of peace as defined colloquially? You know, the likes of Majid Nawaz and Ziba Khan. How exactly have these people come to the conclusion that Islam is indeed a religion of peace? Well, to begin, while they recognize that countless atrocities have been committed in the name of Islam, they nevertheless maintain that these acts are the result of fanatics, extremists, and militants taking Islamic teaching out of context. But to raise an immediate objection, this claim is false. Flat out, demonstrably false. As I demonstrated in my video about Islamophobia, the Quran and the Hadith possess countless violent verses that instruct Muslims. So he made the claim that Quran and the Hadith has countless violent verses that instructs Muslims. Now, this is obviously out of context, but even if this was true, this still doesn't make the argument unsound or false. So, let's take a look at this argument uh, again. Premise 1. Peace is defined as a lack of conflict and a, fear and a freedom from fear of violence. Premise 2. Islam acts according to and in seek of peace. Conclusion. Therefore, Islam is a religion of peace. Now, even if... Uh, the violent verses are taken out of context, it does not contradict the argument. Uh, nowhere in the argument does it say that there will be no violence period. Here he is committing the fallacy of composition. Basically he's saying that because there are some violent verses in the Quran or Hadith, therefore the whole religion is not peaceful. That's complete nonsense. Just because there are some violent elements in Islam when dealing with criminals and war does not mean the whole thing is violent or not peaceful. It's like saying because the cops in Britain 
are allowed to shoot at criminals who shoot at them, therefore Britain is a violent country. Now sure, shooting at criminals is violent. However, that doesn't mean that Britain itself is now violent because of it. It just means that it has some elements of necessary violence. Uh, this type of violence is actually a good thing and exists in all civilization. And the same thing is true for Islam. Sure, there are some violent verses in the Quran and Hadith. However, these are necessary violence. It is necessary to stop criminals and to defend your country from foreign invaders or foreign enemies. They are necessary in order to keep the overall peace and tranquility in society. These are the exception and not the rule. Islam still teaches about love, compassion, forgiveness and mercy. For the most part, that's all it does. So to say that some necessary violence makes the whole thing not peaceful is fallacious and unsound. And moderate Muslims do indeed endorse and commit many reprehensible atrocities with explicit reference to Islamic teaching. What's more is that they do incessantly claim jurisdiction over the experience of others and so they are therefore not peaceful. First of all, this is a lie. Also, what the hell is a moderate Muslim? You're either a Muslim or not. There's no moderate or semi or half Muslim. For example, imagine if I said rationality rules is a radical atheist. Would he be okay with that? Also, uh, here he is contradicting himself. Uh, he is committing the equivocation fallacy. Before, he used, he used the word peace to mean lack of conflict and freedom from fear of violence. Peace is defined as a lack of conflict and a freedom from fear of violence. Now all of a sudden peace means keeping someone's experience intact? They do incessantly claim jurisdiction over the experience of others and so they are therefore not peaceful. They do incessantly claim jurisdiction over the experience of others. They do incessantly claim jurisdiction over the experience of others. So which one is it? Does peace mean lack of conflict and freedom from fear of violence or does it mean that keeping your experience intact? Because it can't be both. So again, as you can see, this is a fallacious and unsound argument. Also, what if the individual only has only bad experiences? You know, like Joker says in his movie. All I have are negative thoughts. So what if the individual is having bad experience? Should we just ignore him? I mean, what if there is poverty? Should the Muslims not claim jurisdiction over the experience of the poor and unfortunate people and give them charity or zakah? I mean, what the hell are you even saying? I mean, is this your quote unquote good idea? Just ignore people who's in trouble? Because apparently, if you interfere and help, then that is being not peaceful. Anyway, let's continue. To name but a few examples, a pool of over 38,000 Muslims from over 39 different countries found that Again, he is committing the fallacy of history generalization. 38,000 Muslims are not even a fraction of 1.8 billion people. So to say somehow the opinions of 38,000 uh, Muslims somehow represent the 1.8 billion of us Muslims is beyond stupid and fallacious. I mean imagine if I said in China the atheists are burning Bibles and forcing monks to wave national flag and torturing Uyghur Muslims. Therefore, all atheists are cunts uh, and I mean, would you accept that argument? Of course not, because it's a stupid argument. Because that number of, of Chinese atheists who are burning Bibles and uh, torturing uh, Uyghur Muslims is extremely small, or at least it's not big enough for to judge all the atheists based on it. So it's a fallacious argument, it's hasty generalization. Uh, the, the number is too small, you cannot generalize based on that. Regardless, let's continue. Harris often uses the example of Jainism as an actual religion of peace, as its central tenet is non-violence and respect towards all living beings. The more extreme a Jainist becomes, the less we need to worry about them. But so far as I am aware, the same cannot be said of any other religion, and especially not for Islam. Yeah, no, while Jainism may be peaceful by definition, it is a completely irrational and illogical religion. Jains are not allowed to have sex except for extreme circumstances. The Jainism also doesn't allow homosexuality, but it's okay there. But whenever it comes to Islam, all of a sudden, no, 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 it's, it's wrong. Also, Jains have an awful diet. Most Jains are extremely skinny or unhealthy. They are fully vegan and their diet is not suitable for pregnant women or, or children who need as much vitamins as possible. Also, there is nothing in Zainism that says that they have to help people 
who are oppressed. If the entire British Empire became Zen monks, then they would have never have to fight the Nazis. I mean, then the Nazis would have won the war, <laughs> most likely. I mean, this is complete rubbish. Also, in Islam, we're taught that we have to help the oppressed. However, Prophet Muhammad taught us that we have to try to resolve a conflict in a peaceful manner without hurting anyone. Uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, peace, be, uh, peace be upon him, said that verily after me there will be conflicts or affairs. If So if you are able to end them in peace, then do so. You can find this in Muslim Ahmed 695. The Prophet also told us not to harm innocent people who have not harmed us. Verily, the most tyrannical of people to God, the exalted, is he who kills those who did not fight him. He said, you can find this hadith in Muslim Ahmed uh, 16,376. Now, one of our most renowned Islamic scholar, Ibn Taymiyyah, talked about jihad in his book. He mentioned that jihad is only a response to military aggression and not religious defense. Majority of scholars agree with this viewpoint. He said, as for the oppressor who does not fight, then there are no texts in which God commands him to be fought. Rather, the unbelievers are only fought on the condition that they wage war, as is practiced by the majority of scholars and is and as is evident in the book of the Sunnah. Uh, you can uh, read about this in Ibn Taymiyyah's book, Kitab al uh, Dubuwat, version volume 1, page number 570. The Prophet also said, according to al Bara ibn Azib and the who narrated this hadith who said and the prophet commanded us to do seven things to visit the sick to follow the funeral uh, procession uh, to bless those who sneeze to return the greetings of peace to accept invitations and to help others fulfill their oath and to support the oppressed you can find this hadith in sahih al-bukhari 5525 which means that we have to find a way to resolve oppression and conflict in this world in a peaceful way violence is only permitted when our enemy is using violence against us otherwise we have to live in peace Jainism does not teach any of this if a Zain sees a man being bullied or oppressed he won't do anything because he believes that you know believes in not harming anybody he won't do anything because he is you know quote unquote peaceful however our Prophet ﷺ taught us that whoever among you sees an evil action let him change it with his hand by taking action if he cannot then with his tongue by speaking out then if he cannot then with his heart by hating it and feeling that it is wrong even though that is probably the weakest of the faith this is narrated by a Muslim hadith number is 49 this is the difference between Zainism and Islam if you think that this is not promoting peace and justice then I don't know what is Either way, let's continue. To quote Harris again, and yes, Harris is going to feature in a lot of my videos because I think he is way beyond his time. Because I think he is way beyond his time. Because I think he is way beyond his time. <laughs> the problem is that Islam isn't a religion of peace. And the so-called extremists are seeking to implement what is arguably the most honest reading of the faith's actual doctrine. No! 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 A second prominent objection that the proponents of this argument present is that of contextualization. For example, to paraphrase Nawaz, Muhammad and the history of Islam must not be judged by the standards of civilization that we, after an accumulation of thousands of years, have arrived at. Islamic history must be judged by the standards of its time. But this is simply nonsense, and here's why. Islam has always uniquely claimed that its teachings are the final and unalterable revelation from the Almighty, and that by extension its edicts are absolutely final. Here he is committing the false equiv equivalence fallacy. He's trying to conflate two different and opposing arguments and saying that they are the same arguments even though they are not. Uh, here's the example. Premise 1. Some say that Islamic history and Prophet Muhammad should be judged based on historical context. Premise 2. Islam has always claimed to be the final revelation from God. Conclusion. Therefore, since Islam is claiming to be the final revelation of God, historical concept, context should matter when judging it. So as you can see, premise 1 and premise 2 are completely opposing or different or different from each other. Islamic history and its teaching is not the same thing. Islamic teaching or teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah most definitely stand the taste of time. However, Islamic history, which is the history of 6th century Arabia or beyond, should be judged based on the historical context. The teaching and the history are not the same thing. So basically, he's trying to conflate the history with, uh, with the teaching. He's 
try to make it seem like the teaching and the history is the same thing even though that's not the uh, what the argument is the argument is basically that uh, historical uh, events in Islam should be judged ba uh, based on the historical context and and the teachings which is taught by the Quran and the Sunnah they stand the test of time obviously but the events that happened the, the history basically that should be judged based on the historical context that's all that's all it's saying so anyway let's continue Therefore, because Muhammad practiced and Islam endorses and encourages elderly men to take young girls as wives, this rule is final. For a Muslim to now contextualize this edict and practice is to reject that Muhammad's example and revelation is final. In Islam, marriage do, uh, do not happen without the consent of the girl. According to Sheikh Ibn Uthman, who is a big scholar in Islam, who said the father should not arrange a marriage for his daughter until she reaches the age of puberty. And when she reaches the age of puberty, he should not arrange a marriage for her unless she gives consent. You can find this hadith in uh, uh, find this uh, find this comment in Shash uh, Sharh Al Mumti, uh, twelve fifty seven to fifty nine. So you cannot marry your daughter unless she gives consent as for the prophet's marriage i've already uh, covered it uh, covered the topic of aisha radhiallahu's marriage in a separate video you can check it out what's more is that even if islam didn't claim to be the final and unalterable word of the creator of the universe we still can and should judge its historical acts despite its context here he is contradicting himself again in one of his videos where he defended sam harris against another youtuber named Shiv, uh, he said that and I quote, Sam Harris was taken out of context. Let's start with context, a thing that most of Harris's critics are not very fond of. Let's start with context. Let's start with context. And yet here he is, uh, you know, talking about Islam. And it, here, when it comes to Islam, all of a sudden context goes out the window. That it shouldn't matter. So which one is it? Should things be taken out of context or not? You cannot say that it's wrong for people to take Sam Harris out of context and then say, but it's, ah, but it's okay if Islam is taken out of context. I mean, how is that consistent? Either taking things out of context is bad or not. You cannot say it's bad for Sam Harris but it's good for Islam, it's a contradiction and, and it's fallacious. Hell, future generations will certainly look back at our actions today and judge us and they should. Also here is committing the historian's fallacy. Basically the historian's fallacy is when you judge a, a person or an event events or, or a historical figure or someone's decision in the past in light of new information that was not available at the time. It's like saying that in 9-11, uh, people shouldn't have been in the Twin Towers because uh, if they were not in the Twin Towers, the two planes that destroyed them uh, couldn't have killed them. I mean, it's obviously fallacious because the victims of 9-11 didn't know that a plane would hit their towers. So judging them based on new information is completely fallacious. The same thing goes with, uh, his, with the historical aspects of Islam or Islamic history. Prophet Muhammad was a man of his time, yes, but his teaching stands the test of time. Uh, he's the best example when it comes to humanity, and he's the guidance, best guidance we have, even to this day. However, that being said, Prophet Muhammad never claimed that he's perfect, and we Sunni Muslims never say that he's perfect either. Now, obviously, some Shias uh, believe that Prophet Muhammad was infallible and perfect, but that's not the belief that Sunni Muslims held. When it comes to things outside of religion, he was a human being just like us. Prophet Muhammad said in a that I am only a human being like you. If I tell you to do something with regards to religion, then follow it. But if I tell you to do something based on my own opinion, then I'm only a human being. Which means that, you know, if, when it comes to rel religious rulings, we have to follow him to the letter. But when it comes to things outside of that, then he can be he can make a mistake. Also, Aisha Radha never complained about the marriage. I mean, she loved the Prophet, peace be upon him. And she also transmitted the highest number of hadiths. She is the first female scholar of Islam, which is a great honor. She is the mother of the uh, of the believers and has a special place in the hearts and minds of Sunni Muslim. So what exactly is it, is his issue here? And with that, I will end the video. But before I go, I'll share a Quran verse and a hadith with you from Prophet Muhammad Sallam, which shows why Islam is a religion of peace. So in the Quran, it says, "O you who believe, do not enter the houses of others other than yours, your own houses, until uh, your assertion welcome and greet the inhabitants with peace. This is best for you, and then perhaps you will be." Uh, reminded. This can be found in Surah Al-Nur uh, 24, uh, 27, verse number 24, so chapter number 24, verse number 27. Another verse says, when you enter
enter houses offer greetings of peace upon each other and greeting a uh, greeting from allah blessed and good uh, this can also be found in surah al-nur 24 chapter number 24 verse number 59 here allah SWT is teaching us manners the prophet sallam said uh, according to a report by uh, ibn amr who reported that a man asked the prophet which islam is best the messenger of allah peace and blessing be upon him said to feed the hungry to greet with peace those you know and those you do not know here islam is teaching us to be kind to both people we know and to people we don't know. This is how Islam is teaching us how to create a peaceful society. By being kind and loving even to people we don't know. When you have a society that worship Allah SWT alone, that is, that is kind to one another, that knows one another, that understands one another, that cares about one another. Only then you can have true a, a true peaceful society. Islam brings people together, but atheism and secularism divides people away. There is nothing in atheism that can bring people together other than the hatred for their religion. I mean, how can you have a peaceful society based on such a negative emotion? How can something like that teach you to be kind to one another? You know, when an, I, I read an article recently where it, where it said that in Germany, an old woman was found dead in her apartment after two years. Honestly, it made me tear up. How could no one notice that she was dead? I mean, why didn't anyone care? Where was her rel relatives? I mean, can you imagine something like this in an Islamic society? When my father died, my family and I were swarming with relatives. There were people that I knew and there were, there, there were people that I didn't. However, the funeral or the zanaza brought everyone together, even the relatives who we had conflict with or, we, or who we haven't seen in years. This is the result of secularism or atheism, isolating individuals because you have nothing in common. Is this peace? Is this supposed to be peace, dying without anyone knowing? How does this bring people together? I mean, if she lived during the time of the Salaf, maybe the Muslim neighbors would go and visit her because the Prophet told us to visit the sick. Maybe if her neighbors followed Islam, things could have been different. But alas, she lived in a secular society. This is why there is a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, Abu Huraira reported, The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessing be upon him, said, You will not enter paradise until you have faith. And you will not have faith until you love each other. Shall I show you something that if you did, you would love each other, spread peace between yourselves. Sahih Muslim, Hadith number 54. This is why Islam is the religion of peace. It teaches us to love one another. It teaches us how to reduce conflict in society, how to create a peaceful society by bringing people together. And no, you don't have to study some Buddhist philosophy or become a Zen monk for that, to have a peaceful society. All you have to do is just visit your neighbor when they're sick. That's all you need to do.